Now I'd like to turn to uh, something that I think is going to be really different for our show. I've never uh, been involved in this kind of activity before, but I think it may well be for some of us uh, a future for our model railroading. Uh, Heath uh, Human or Heath Hurwitz uh, has developed a, a remote operating switching layout. And he's here tonight to tell us a little bit about it and how it operates and how we as model railroaders can operate on it. So Heath, thank you so very much for being here tonight. Hi, Jim, uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Heath Hurwitz, as you said. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about my remotely operated switching puzzle and why I decided to do something uh, a little bit different with my modeling. I'm currently a project manager in the audiovisual and construction fields working for an LED display manufacturer. Uh, but back in March of 2020, I lost my job in the live events industry and decided that I needed to learn a new skill. I thought that online gatherings would increase. So I ended up creating a YouTube channel based around model railroading, uh, which I had just picked up again after a long hiatus uh, starting in December of 2019. It reminded me of how much I loved model railroading and I really got back into it and have met a really amazing community. I set up a goal for myself to combine my skills in audio visuals to expand the online community around model railroading. For me, model railroading is all about troubleshooting and it involves every category of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. It allows me to feed my creativity as well as my passion for electricity and electronics. I can't go around sticking things in outlets anymore and get away with it. So model railroading allows me to scratch that itch. My experience with model railroading up until 2020 and joining the model railroad community was primarily rail fanning layouts. As a kid, I went to the Greenberg train shows and saw a lot of trains just running in loops. I thought that all layouts were built for continuous running and turnouts were only used to move a train from one loop to the other or for additional scenic details. As I got more and more into model railroading as an adult, I had my heart set on a layout that was built around continuous running. But I kept hearing about how exciting operations were, but I didn't really understand what it was and why I would want to do it, which then made me want to learn about it. I do not consider myself a prototypical modeler, not even close. I model what I like, regardless of era or region or whether something goes together with something else. Prototypes, operations, modeling, the real railroad stuff is all new to me. If you wanna hear from an expert in switching layouts, there are much better resources than me. Uh, today is really just about my journey and my transition from continuous running to building a shelf layout and to possibly inspire others to make the switch from continuous running to operations. My model railroad collection consists of trains related to the circus in Z, N, H, O, S, O, and G scale. So I wouldn't say I, I've picked a specific scale. I, I model a little bit of everything. Uh, my layout growing up was all H, O scale, but I was looking into building something, uh, currently building something in N scale that better fits uh, my space. When in the planning stages, I thought I had to model in T-Track and, and do something modular and that I would never have this quote unquote real layout. There wasn't any way I'd be able to have a permanent continuous running layout and making something modular was a good alternative. I've worked at home on and off for several years and had a corner office in our one bedroom apartment. Therefore, my home office also became my modeling railroading area. In this photo, you can see the first T-Track module that I was building. After about a year of working from home and building my model railroad empire, my partner and I decided that I needed a space of my own. So living in New York, space is uh, quite a premium. I found a 77 square foot office to rent. I started designing different space configurations to try and figure out where I could have my office and also have a layout. Uh, one big obstacle was that the door swings into the space and being a rental, I couldn't change this. 
In the bottom right of the photo, you can see a shelf that I set up that runs over the door that I'm using for a G scale and an O scale continuous running loop. Uh, the office studio is a nine foot by eight foot room. It currently makes up my work from home office, uh, my streaming studio for a YouTube channel and my model railroad collection and layout. Uh, Jim, I don't know if they noticed, they've been asking uh, in the chat to take the spotlight off of you because uh, you're the one that is in the corner up on That's uh, fine. YouTube. So... Um, uh, so I, um, ah, where was I? Uh, so I have a lot of stuff in a really small uh, space. Um, I have this automatic back and forth track, which uh, if you ever get to see me, uh, you can still see I've got an HO scale train uh, that ping pongs back and forth, but uh, I, I wanted something else. So I decided to build a shelf layout to discover uh, why people enjoyed uh, switching trains. When trying to decide what switching puzzle I wanted to build, I wanted something complicated, but not too complicated. And there I am, now you can see me. Uh, I tend to err on the side of complicated, which you might get a sense of later in this presentation. Although I wasn't initially thinking about remote operations, I wanted something that I could learn about all the various electronics associated in the hobby. Uh, DCC was also very new to me and I wanted to experience all of its possibilities. When I started researching options, uh, Ingle Nook Sidings, of course, uh, came up a lot. And I found this uh, great website that had a good write-up on several self-switching puzzles. I decided I would build a puzzle and not a layout, which for me meant not a prototypical industrial yard. But Ingle Nook Sidings with two turnouts just didn't feel like it was complicated enough uh, for me to be you know, excited about it. Uh, another option I found online was Switchman's, Lightmare, Switchman's Nightmare by Lynn Westcott. Uh, this puzzle had a lot of promise as I saw some really interesting examples where modelers had turned the puzzle into uh, really like scenic masterpieces, so almost uh, looking very prototypical. But with 10 turnouts, this was a little more complicated that I wanted to tackle, which brought me to the Time Saver by John Allen. And as stated by Goldilocks and the Three Bears, this one is just right. Uh, the time saver with five turnouts was a good middle ground for what I was uh, looking at doing. Also, when considering adding in all the technology, uh, the smaller layout would be less expensive. Uh, this was a, one of the considerations for me in choosing the time saver over the Switchman's Nightmare. Uh, the straight track along the top of the design I am considering as my main line where I could at a later time add an operational element where fake cars would be dropped off from another zone. Uh, this was also an idea that I saw online where two time savers could be uh, connected uh, together uh, so that they could pass freight cars between each other. I did end up removing the curves that you see in the drawing, uh, made them straight, which would make remote coupling easier. And I also have it set up with the idea of using movable bumpers and end stops to change the difficulty of the puzzle by shortening any of the tracks. Uh, for my variation, I did add a sixth turnout, which is the additional spur you see at the bottom. Uh, this is where I put my programming track as well as just providing another option to spot cars. I currently have uh, five delayed uncoupling magnets on my version. Uh, I might add a sixth on the bottom spur. There's a little bit of a problem when you try and uh, push cars around uh, that turnout onto that bottom spur that they end up uh, recoupling. I'd already owned all of the track because I'd purchased it when I was considering other layout stuff. I used Atlas Code 80 snap track and turnouts. Uh, the shelf is a 48 inch by 10 inch shelf that I picked up at the local hardware store. And I covered the shelf with half inch cork and I just used track nails to secure all the track. I actually wound up laying the track twice uh, in order to provide more realistic operation, or not realistic, in order to provide more reliable operations, 
Uh, I swapped out the Atlas turnouts that had insulated frogs for Pico electric electro frogs. Uh, Atlas number four turnouts are 12 and a half degrees, whereas the Pico medium turnouts are 10 degrees. Uh, so that, that small difference in two and a half degrees basically meant I had to uh, relay everything. This did uh, solve an issue I was having with the four axle switcher and the isolated frogs. Energizing the frogs was much easier than adding a keep alive to my N scale locomotives. Uh, Atlas Code 80 track is compatible with either Pico Code 80 or Code 55. So the track uh, heights aligned uh, really well. And this is a little bit of a uh, comment for Jason the Train Freak. Uh, I did use uh, Pico joiners because I liked their smaller profile over the Atlas uh, track joiners. I used a Dremel with a router attachment to cut in the delayed uncoupling magnets. Uh, and at this point, I was starting to uh, really focus on building this for remote operations. So I painted uh, the magnets, I taped off all the other track and painted the magnets just to make them a little more uh, visible. The showstopper uh, and, the and this move to increased online communities had a huge influence on my model railroading at this point and uh, really influenced my uh, decisions when building this switching puzzle. I was able to connect with a lot of different people and borrow some of their ideas and methodologies when building my layout. But we all had different goals. And I think a lot of our uh, different goals really impacted who used uh, what uh, technology on their, uh, you know, their remote operation setups. My biggest uh, influence in my decision to make a puzzle for remote operations was Bernard Beck uh, at uh, Silicon Valley Lines and seeing him being interviewed on the TSG Multimedia YouTube channel. He did a lot of the initial work in implementing remote operations over there. Uh, SVL though is very dedicated uh, on their website. They say it's dedicated to operating our models in a realistic fashion. Uh, and their remote operations followed that mission. So everything they did was set up so that the operations could be as prototypical as possible, even with uh, remote operators. They ended up using uh, Discord voice chat where the remote engineers can talk to a remote dispatcher to get permission to proceed to uh, a specific spot on the railroad. The, the dispatcher would confirm that the route is clear and adjust any turnouts as needed and you know, release the train to proceed. They did have local yard masters as well as, you know, other local uh, support for the remote crews, but, you know, they tried to move a lot of the, the engineering operations, uh, you know, remotely. Uh, Silicon Valley Lines has a very limited internet connection, which is something that uh, has hindered the expansion of their remote operations. Uh, but even so, they've done a lot uh, within the limited resources that they have. Uh, another layout uh, that I took some inspiration from was Dave uh, Abelie's Onondaga Cutoff. Uh, this layout also runs very prototypically on timetables. Uh, I'm also aware there are several other layouts that have remote operations set up, such as uh, Speed Mueller, who was actually here on New Tracks uh, not too long ago talking about uh, MQ trains. Uh, Brad Anderson down in Australia, Andy Ambrose over in the UK. There are a lot of different people experimenting with remote operations, but there hasn't sort of come up with any single universal system or methodology uh, that everyone is following. Uh, my goal is to create a puzzle or a layout uh, that could be remotely operated and also easily accessible. Uh, while I was able to take guidance from the others that had ventured into the realm before me, there were still several challenges that I had to personally overcome. Uh, one of my goals with remote operations is that I wanted the remote operator to be the one that actually uh, solved the puzzle without requiring any local input. I wanted to move as much of the, the process of running uh, the railroad to being uh, remote. Uh, a lot of the solution then, of course, came down to technology. Uh, I wasn't sure 
exactly what was going to give the remote operator the best uh, experiment experience. Uh, kind of, you know, done some troubleshooting, found out some things, and I think I have a pretty good uh, system going at this point. Uh, I started just by adding things that I knew that I would need. Uh, I am using slow motion switch machines as they can all be remotely controlled. Uh, I use Smails for turnout control. Uh, these are slow motion switch machines with the DCC decoders actually built inside of them. I also, uh, even though I, I, the goal was to have this remotely operated, I did also add push buttons for local turnout control. Uh, one nice feature of the Smails is they actually have a terminal block where you can just uh, wire up these buttons directly uh, to the Smail, which, which made that part pretty simple. Uh, I added uh, dwarf signals next to each turnout to indicate its current position. Uh, this is where I'm starting to get into more of the interaction between the physical layout and the remote operators. Uh, the signals are actually facing the cameras for easy visibility, and the colors also will match the colors that are in uh, Panel Pro on my JMRI panel that the remote operator has access to. Uh, the control, uh, to control the state of the dwarf signals, um, I'm using the SP uh, single pole single throw switches that are built right into the uh, smells. You look at all this wiring underneath, uh, a lot of that is just for the turnouts, but I did try and keep it uh, as neat as possible for easy troubleshooting. Each section of track is also isolated so that I could add block detection in the future. Uh, on the top photo on the right side, you can actually see the digit keys uh, DR4088LNCS, uh, which is already wired in for block detection. Uh, it's just one of the future things that I need to uh, set up in JMRI. The heart of this DCC system is the DigiKeys DR5000 command station. Uh, I have a, a UR93 for Digitrax throttles, uh, TCS throttles. Uh, will connect via the Y throttle server that's running on my laptop. And I've got a protothrottle receiver there in the center, which is connected via ExpressNet. Uh, this switching puzzle, or this, sorry, this command station uh, runs the switching puzzle as, way, as well as the layout expansion that I'm going to mention a little bit later. Uh, I'm also using a DCC Concepts alpha meter to monitor the power, and I have DCC Specialties PSX1 digital circuit breakers with the buzzers installed for additional short protection. Uh, some of this technology included uh, is intended for me to just learn about DCC. Uh, others of it is specifically set up uh, to enhance uh, the remote operations of the puzzle. One requirement uh, for the remote switching of a yard or a puzzle is a low latency connection between the remote operator and the model railroad. Um, Again, the goal was is that that remote operator was going to do everything. They were going to um, operate the switches. They were going to couple and uncouple cars. They were going to control the locomotive. They're going to be able to do everything uh, remotely. So I had to solve the problem of how somebody can remotely see well enough to couple and uncouple N-scale boxcars. So I had to figure out how many cameras am I gonna to need to do this on my 48 inch by 10 inch shelf? Where should the cameras be placed? How can the remote operators see the magnets and like where the turnouts are as they're, as they're moving around the layout? The difference between this photo on the left and the photo on the right is very subtle in N scale, especially over a camera. But I had to come up with a reliable way for a remote operator to be able to uh, see the difference. Uh, and not only just see it, but be able to control the locomotive with enough precision to achieve coupling and uncoupling without immense frustration. Uh, Roy Eltham, I, I'm talking to you. Uh, the backbone of the remote operations portion of the railroad is JMRI, Java Model Railroad Interface. Uh, I have this software running on a dedicated 2018 MacBook Pro uh, through the use of the built-in JMRI web server. 
operator is able to remotely access the locomotive's throttle and the turnout control. Uh, while low latency is important for the throttle control, it's also extremely important uh, with what the operator sees. Um, so the, uh, basically this required uh, me to set up this camera and using things like Skype or Zoom or Teams uh, wasn't gonna work because uh, there's just too much lag when you have to send your camera signal up into the cloud and then have your operator view what is then being sent back. Uh, so the ultra low latency view that I have for this layout is provided uh, through a peer-to-peer -peer video connection. And it's a service that I use called Video Ninja. Uh, the camera that I'm using is a GoPro Hero 9 connected via an HDMI capture card to that same computer that's running JMRI. And I'm using HD HDMI over a USB uh, camera to get um, to get higher quality. I added a member of the railroad crew to stand next to the uncoupling magnet, which helps the remote engineer see, when, uh, see where the center of the magnets were located. Uh, one of the earlier bits of feedback was uh, if you had a boxcar on the uh, track in front, you couldn't really see where the center of the magnets were, or even a boxcar on, you know, over the magnet, you couldn't really see it. So adding this railroad crew member made it easier for the remote operator uh, to see. Uh, I chose to use the Great Northern boxcars because I'm really into circus trains. Uh, and they call this set the Great Northern, uh, they call this set of Great Northern boxcars, uh, the circus trains. Uh, in 1956, Great Northern painted up 10 40-foot boxcars and experimental paint schemes and sent them around the Great Northern system for employee input. Uh, some of the paint schemes were incredibly loud and garish, thus earning the moniker Circus Cars. Uh, in addition to the various different colors of the boxcars, I also added large numbers from a label maker on the top of the cars that match their reporting marks. Uh, this makes the cars easier to identify in the camera because you can reference both the color and uh, the number. The boxcars were all uh, pre-1996 Mike trains. So they also needed to receive new trucks, couplers, and metal wheel sets. Uh, it also added weight to the boxcars right over the trucks, bringing them up to about 1.1 ounces. Uh, these small modica modifications really improved uh, the uncoupling and coupling of the cars. The switcher that I'm using is a Broadway Limited Imports SW7 Great Northern number 163 with a Paragon 4 decoder. And just because we all wanna hear that Paragon 4 sound, uh, I've mounted a lavalier microphone directly above the switching layout to better capture all the sounds from the locomotive. So while the goal is 100% remote operations, sometimes uh, things happen. So I do have a Discord channel that I use for when people need local support uh, of their remotely operated uh, puzzle. But the concept is, is that uh, local intervention, even uh, with N scale, uh, would rarely be needed. Uh, now that we've gone through the background and the basics of all this construction, uh, we're now at the point that everyone's basically waiting for, how do you remotely operate this layout? Uh, a goal was to make this puzzle as easily accessible for everybody, which meant for me that I didn't want the remote operators to have to download any specific software. I didn't want them to have to download Zoom or like download some VNC client or download some you know, remote method of getting in. I wanted to make it as simple as possible so I added everything to a website that can be accessed by most browsers that people already have on their uh, computers or tablets. Uh, to log into the puzzle, uh, you need just the link and a password. Uh, this is what the log on page will look like. Uh, for best results, I do recommend a Chromium-based browser, uh, such as Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, or Opera. I have also used my iPhone and iPad, but the larger screens on the computer uh, make seeing, especially the video, makes, uh, makes it a little bit easier to see everything. Uh, 
I changed the password as needed uh, just to ensure that there's only one or two max operators uh, accessing the controls at the same time. Uh, the limit is required uh, to keep the camera latency to a minimum. The more people that log in, because it's a direct connection, the slower uh, the connection. There are options that I can implement to allow more viewers uh, if needed. Um, you can run the puzzle in teams, uh, one person logging in and operating the throttle and the other person uh, controlling the switches. Uh, so it does have, there's not only one way to operate it. Uh, after entering the password, uh, you get taken to this main page or what, I, what I'm calling the main page. Uh, currently, you're gonna need to open all three links. You're gonna need to open the camera, the throttle, and the turnouts in separate uh, browser windows. Uh, I'm working on a solution that's gonna embed all these controls into uh, one web page. Currently, it's just, uh, currently, it's just not there yet. So I'm continually looking for other methods uh, access and operate the puzzle. So things are, things are progressing. If the remote control system is not running uh, on this main page, uh, you'll see the, uh, what is on that image on the left. It's kind of just that blue, uh, that blue square, blue rectangle block. Uh, but if the system is running on the main page, you'll be able to uh, see the camera. And all you need to do to open up the camera uh, in, a, in a big browser is you click the, uh, the hyperlink, which is the word camera up top. And it opens up this full screen view and it is audio enabled. As I mentioned, there is a, uh, a microphone on it. Uh, the, this camera page should open in a separate window or tab. Uh, so that you can now go back to the main page and open up the, uh, the throttle and switch panel. Uh, you next, you would just click that, uh, the hyperlink, which is the word throttle up top, which then opens up the throttle page. Uh, this is the throttle from uh, JRMRI web server. You'll see the locomotive number of the Great Northern 163 on the top center of the screen. To turn the track power on, uh, you press and hold the O in the top left corner for about two seconds. Uh, you can see right now that, uh, that sort of red square up in the top left. It's red when it's off, as uh, shown in that left image. And it's green when it's on, uh, which you can see what that looks like in the image on the right. Uh, those red and green carrots that are at the bottom are your uh, forward and reverse for the locomotive. And all the function keys, all the F keys uh, are enabled and you will hear all of the sounds of the locomotive through uh, the camera links audio enabled web page. Uh, I do ask, uh, we are operating within yard limits and uh, generally I'm in this room when people are operating the layout. So I do ask that you, know, you don't need to run the bell constantly or blow the horn constantly. Um, as much as I enjoy all the sounds, <laughs> uh, don't need to hear them constantly, but uh, yes, they are, they are enabled. Uh, the camera uh, view and the switch panel uh, do need to be on a computer or a tablet, uh, but the throttle, uh, there are other options. Uh, you can use Wi-Fi th wi throttles. So if you're really into you know, uh, Y throttle or engine driver, or if you have uh, one of the TCS uh, UWT throttles, uh, we can also uh, connect that up to the puzzle as well. So instead of using a computer interface, you can use your, you know, your usual uh, throttle. Uh, back on the main page, uh, we go back and open up the turnout panel. Uh, you press that hyperlink at the top that says turnouts. Uh, and just to reiterate, my goal is uh, some point in the very near future to get all of this on one page so you won't have to open everything separately. Uh, the turnout panel shows the six turnouts, 11 through 16. Uh, you click the round circle at each of the turnout locations to change its direction. Uh, green is basically straight and when it's red, it's diverging. Um, I do recommend that uh, when you first start up the puzzle and turn on the layout. 
uh, run each of the turnouts once just to make sure that uh, the, the JMRI system and, and how the turnouts are set uh, in reality actually uh, line up. Uh, the turnout panel also identifies all of the potential car spots. So, uh, you know, this is, this is a switching puzzle. Uh, so there will be, uh, you know, locations to spot cars. Mainline left's abbreviated with ML, tracks one through four, just T1 through T4. And the, the runaround is labeled uh, RA right there in the center. And all of these potential locations are related to the gamification of the puzzle. Um, gamification is a huge part of uh, building this and why this ease of access is so important uh, uh, to me is because I want people to like experience the game and the, you know, the fun uh, of model railroading. So another one of the problems uh, that I had was how I was going to, uh, you know, gamify this, like, you know, what needed to be created to do this. And I guess first I had to figure out what the challenges were going to be. So what I decided we would do is have a randomly generated list, which was based on a challenge level that you could pick which then provided you the track location and the box cars that needed to be spotted in each location. So let's break this down a little bit. Uh, so the challenge provides you a randomized solution that you can play, obviously, if you choose. Uh, it's essentially your work order. Uh, so based on the number of box cars on the puzzle, the length of the spurs, and the difficulty level cho chosen, it could either increase or decrease your sort of, you know, gamification of this. So typically there's one switcher and seven box cars uh, on the layout at a time. Uh, there are four levels that you can choose from, apprentice, journeyman, expert, and master. Uh, we found the master level takes about an hour or so to complete. Uh, the different options provide a different quantity of box cars that you need to spot. So, oh, uh, apprentice level provides you two box cars that you need to spot, which is the uh, top left image. Uh, bottom, bottom left image is the journeyman, which is four. Uh, in the middle is expert level, which is six. And then master level is seven or more. Uh, if at some point it makes sense to have uh, more cars on the switching puzzle, then that master level will just have the maximum uh, number. Uh, for the apprentice level, even though you only need to spot two cars, all seven of the box cars will still be on the puzzle. So you may need to move other box cars out of the way to spot the two box cars uh, for, the, for the apprentice challenge, but you don't have to put those other box cars in any uh, specific location. Uh, this program was actually written by another model railroad YouTuber, uh, Late Night Model Railroad. Uh, the script runs on a server uh, that I run, uh, you know, here locally. And I do that so that the results can be shared uh, everywhere. So while the layout uh, that we just looked at is all for the remote operator, uh, you know, because it's a game and because I want to get people involved, I've also set up a way to share the playing of the game with everybody. So this is the view that I can send to YouTube. So if there are one or two operators operating the puzzle, uh, everybody else can go to YouTube and, uh, and watch what's going on. They can see you know, the panel, see where the turnouts are. They can see the challenge uh, in the top left corner. And all of this is separate from the, uh, you know, the camera and everything else. So the late, this doesn't affect the latency of uh, the camera or the throttle or any of those uh, pieces and parts. So while I'm still tweaking the puzzle to continue improving things, uh, it is at this moment 100% operational. And because I keep tweaking things, Sometimes I end up breaking more than I fix, uh, but ultimately for me, this hobby is more about 
leaning into and not being afraid of breaking things. Uh, it's about trying new things, problem solving, and having a good time. Uh, so I'm working on some updates. I'm going to be adding uh, block detection, uh, adding turnout feedback, installing uh, frog juicers, and also updating the website, as I mentioned, to embed all of the controls uh, into one page. But the big change of this entire process is my newfound appreciation for operations and the mindset change that happened from this project uh, and how it's influencing my future layout design decisions. I'm creating an expansion off of this. So I have a new expansion uh, called the Riverside Transfer. Uh, it's gonna be an N scale point to point switching layout. There will be no continuous uh, loops anymore. So the name of the layout is based on uh, Riverside Park, which is the photo on the top right, which is the park that's right outside uh, my window here, and the 69th Street Transfer Bridge, which is that photo on the bottom. Uh, there's going to be a staging yard, two industrial areas, one of the industrial areas being the remotely operated uh, puzzle, uh, a main yard, a car float, as well as a small uh, town. The layout's about 22 linear feet altogether. Uh, it's all just shelf, they're all, they're all shelves. Uh, the layout is gonna be designed for two local operators and one remote operator. So uh, the puzzle can be operated as a puzzle you know, in itself, uh, not connected to anything else, but the puzzle can also operate with the two local operators where they pass uh, freight cars back and forth as well. Here's some additional photos of the 69th Street transfer bridge as it exists today. Uh, this is the last remaining transfer bridge on Manhattan, in Manhattan, uh, and there's now a park along the waterfront that uh, is basically a tribute uh, to railroading. It was a, uh, it was the location of a New York Central uh, yard. So when I was laid off, I looked around and decided online was becoming significantly more popular and I wanted to be a part of it, both from a career perspective and I had plenty of time to learn new things. And I cannot be more thankful uh, that I found the model railroading community. Building the time saver variation is one way that I'm trying to give back uh, to the community of model railroading and help uh, expand uh, you know, what people think of model railroading. Uh, my YouTube channel and my time saver variation are both named uh, Humanity Junction. And the H uh, in my logo, it makes up sort of the bed uh, where the city can rest. Uh, the city is made up of the humans. You can see the U-M-A-N in the uh, buildings uh, because it really is the humans that make up a city. Uh, we're going to set up some opportunities. Uh, Jim and I have talked about, uh, you know, how to, to get other people operating the puzzle and maybe doing a small challenge or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if people should reach out directly to Jim or to me or how we're doing it yet, but uh, there will be uh, more on that uh, to come. And uh, this is the train inspector uh, who's taken a much needed break after this complicated uh, project. So uh, Jim said I could take about 45 minutes. I've taken up about 38. So I, I think we've got a couple minutes left if uh, anybody's got any questions. So let me ask you this. Uh, let, let's say that I want to be one of your remote operators. Exactly what do I have to do? So I will send you a link. You will go to that link on in a web browser. So um, I believe like you use an iPad, so you can go to Safari, um, right. you know, uh, click on that link and I'll give you a password and you would enter that password, which takes you to that, uh, that main page uh, that I showed you in the, um, in the presentation. And right. then from there, you would open, for now, you open those three web pages. Right turn on the track power. Right. And then essentially it's no different than if you were standing here right next to it. 
you know, you, you operate the throttle, you operate the turnouts, uh, just as if you were, you were right here. Uh, gotcha. Some people like just getting on and just sort of playing and moving things around. Uh, other people like having uh, a challenge. So they like, you know, selecting some level of the challenge and, and then trying to uh, finish the challenge. Uh, some options for the challenge are, you know, finishing it as quickly as possible, finishing it in as few moves as possible. Uh, and those are sort of, uh, that's some of the gamification that John Allen uh, instilled in the time saver when he first uh, designed it. Gotcha. Well, listen, I, I, I don't know how we're going to do it yet either, but I, I like the idea of opening up to the viewers and maybe have one uh, person a, a night or, or two people, if, if they're both uh, doing the uh, apprentice part of it, maybe we've got enough time for two people a night to uh, be able to try it, to see exactly what's involved with this remote operation because it is so new. And as far as I know, uh, you're the only one that has uh, a switching layout that's really involved in this kind of remote operation right now. All of the others are, like you say, uh, uh, continuous run operations, even though they may run on schedule, uh, but they're basically continuous run operations, where yours, uh, I think, is uh, exciting because it gives people in a small space uh, the operation to really get involved in operations, as you say, but also have some fun doing it if all they want to do is spend a, an hour or two switching some cars around. So I, you know, I think it's a wonderful uh, idea. And you know, for people that can do it remote, they really don't have to have space anymore. So space for model railroader is, is really eliminated uh, because they can do a lot of this uh, remotely if the remote takes off and if the people involved today in remote operation come up with some kind of standard so that wh whatever remote operation railroad you're doing, you can do it basically the same way. So it's not a new learning experience every time you you log in to, uh, to Joe's versus Sam versus Fred's uh, remote operation. Yeah, I definitely think there's a place for this because there are a lot of people out there that are playing uh, train video games. Yeah. And I think that uh, that interface that they have with the computer and with the game, uh, I think there's something, at least for me, something interesting about the railroad they're operating being an actual physical railroad right. and there's there's a lot of differences in that you know physical opportunity than uh you know the the games that are there i i agree and when we first talked that's what really appealed to me because of the concept of gaming that you've put it with but but also the, the challenges that go along with that because you know it, it, like you say you could have teams of two people each uh, going against each other and see how quickly they can do it or how long it takes to do it and so forth uh, or how many cars they can get moved uh, in the right position in a given period of time. So I, I think there's a lot of challenges that can be done. What I know that you're due back on the, uh, the 10th of August for the yep. next day. And I'm wondering if maybe we could take that show and just go through it as, as if all of us are doing it, but only one person, and maybe that one person has to be you. And we put all three screens up and you show us one at a time. This is the button you push and this is what happens. This is the next button and this is what happens. And maybe set up uh, a, a game that you can play for us and show us what's involved really in using the three screens that you have. And then maybe the next time then we can actually have people on the show start participating and, and see how they do it once they get a better understanding of exactly what it takes to do it and how, how, each, uh, how they have to, to work with your system. Yeah, and I would definitely say too, like I, um, I know what to do. Uh, what I would think might be uh, good for all of us is if there is somebody that has a lot of interest in it that wouldn't mind being the guinea pig and yeah. wouldn't mind doing it live, uh, it might be interesting to walk, uh, walk through it with somebody that doesn't you know, have any pre uh, experience with it. I, I couldn't agree more. And we'll see if we can't find somebody now. Absolutely. Uh, why don't you send, why don't you do this? Send me an email and I'll get in touch with Heath and, and uh, uh, we'll see how we can put this together. 
So if you're interested, and as he says, being the guinea pig, uh, because you're really interested in this and want to learn how to do it, send me an email to Jim Kello, J-I-M-K-E-L-L-O-W, at New Tracks Modeling, N-E-W-T-R-A-C-K-S-M-O-D-E-L-I-N-G dot com. And we'll make sure that uh, you get uh, in touch with Heath and Heath can give you some uh, behind the scenes information before the show. But this will happen on, on the show on August the 10th, be the next time that Keith is back with us. So if you'd like to do this, let me know and we'll schedule you. Jim, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Heath, I can't thank you so much for coming. And, and I think that this is really going to be something that uh, is really going to be a part of model railroading in, in the future. It may bring a lot of younger people into the hobby simply because they like to play the game. I, I think that's yeah. a wonderful concept. And I really do appreciate meeting you and, and, and uh, finding out about what you're doing for the hobby. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Heath, I got a quick question. Uh, is, uh, you just mentioned about having at least three screens open. Does that mean it cannot be used on uh, mobile devices or do, and has to be on a computer? So what I recommend if you're using a mobile device is that you would open, let's say the video on a, like an iPad at least, or a tablet at least, and then use your, um, like use a smartphone or something then for your throttle. Uh, so there's, to be, able, to be able to see the detail that you need to see to effectively switch uh, the cars, I do think having a, as big of a possible video as possible. I think I just said the same thing twice, but I think you understood what I'm saying. Yeah, the, yeah, the so bigger the video, the easier your life is going to be, essentially. So you need at least two mobile devices for it to work. Um, ideally, or, you know, or at least uh, um, when I did it with my dad and I talked my dad through it, he had his laptop and his phone. And we had him set up the, uh, the video on his laptop and the throttle on his phone. So hey, understood. Yep. What 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 you're really seeing on the uh, the laptop or on the uh, uh, the, the one uh, uh, mobile device is really the out is really uh, where the cars and engine is and where the switches are and so forth. Am I right? Correct. Yep. All the operation itself is going to be on your cell phone. Yep. You can do it that way. Absolutely. Yeah. And the only reason to have the two devices is you need a large as, as possible screen shot of the system of, of where the cars are, where the engine is and where the switches and where the uh, uncoupling wraps are uh, so that yeah. you can uh, then uh, maneuver the cars there and uh, press the right buttons on your cell phone. Yeah. And what we're getting into is a little bit of where the advantages of like the Silicon Valley lines or Dave Abley's Onondaga cutoff is that um, in their scenarios, you don't really need to see the detail and the, um, you know, and have as directive of, of a connection with controlling the locomotive as you do when you're trying to switch in a yard. Yeah. Right. So, you know, like uh, if, if all I'm doing is essentially moving the locomotive forward and stopping based right. on somebody else telling me when to move forward and stop, then yes, you, you know, you can have limited screen space. So I do understand that while I am trying to make this as easy to access for everybody, uh, that unfortunately one of the requirements is to have a big enough screen where you can see the couplers on the end scale box cars to know whether they're actually connected or not. So what we're, what we're talking about, anybody that wants to do this is gonna to have to have at least a tablet or, and a cell phone, or at least a, a laptop and a cell phone or a computer and a cell phone. Either way, you're gonna need the cell phone for the, for the control, yeah. right? So you're gonna uh, have no, to- no. You, can, uh, you can do the control on the computer as well. Um, but not on the tablet. Uh, you could use, do the, the uh, JMRI web server 
has a throttle that you can load onto any sort of computer device. So on a, uh, you know, it can be a computer, a laptop, an iPhone, you can load it onto anything and you can use that. So you don't need a secondary device for the throttle if you have enough screen space. And, and we can look at that. We can look at that on August 10th as well. Um, I, I've sort of set up and, uh, you know, one of the, the image that I send to YouTube is kind of how I recommend setting things up a little bit so that you can have everything on the screen and still sort of see everything. You know, you make the throttle and the, and the turnout small and you make the, the video big right. um, and, and operate it that way. So you can do it all on one uh, device. Now, we have, we have viewers both on YouTube and on Zoom. Can, either, can, can viewers from either one of that uh, participate in, on the 10th of uh, August? Absolutely, yeah. I actually, I mean, if you're curious, like... Because um, we live, this, stream, we live this, stream the show to, to YouTube. Yeah, so this, this view right here, um, this is a live <laughs> view. You can see I'm just sticking my hand in it right now. But that, you know, that's the time saver running right there. And we yeah. can send that to Zoom or to YouTube uh, or, or wherever. I, I, have, uh, I have the technology. We can make it happen. Okay, so we, we, we're live on Zoom, but we live stream to YouTube at the same time. And it's then it's recorded on on YouTube. So whether you're a viewer on YouTube or Zoom on August the 10th, when when you're back and we're we're doing the first uh, demo, uh, the person that's doing it can be on either uh, either YouTube or Zoom. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Heath? Yeah, uh, Heath, if I'm using your system. Does someone have to wait till I'm finished to come on and use it? Uh, right now, the way it's set up is it's a, a single password. So whoever I give the password to could log in. Um, they wouldn't kick you out if they logged in, but the, uh, the video would start degrading. So like if two, three, four people started logging in, it would. Uh, but I can very quickly change the password, which then you know, would mean I can control who can, uh, who can come in and out. Um, actually, I mean, that, that is one thing that uh, I'm not a very good web developer, uh, but I'm building a lot of this through a web page. Uh, so if there is somebody that is really good at password protected websites and could help me set something up where I could basically, the ideal scenario would be that I set up a password that a registered user could use, let's say, between three o'clock and four o'clock. And then at four o'clock, the next registered user could come in from four to five. And that would be something I'd love to set up uh, within the website right now. Uh, that's not the way it's set up. I have found uh, the people that have used it so far that the model railroad community is general, generally very respectful of, uh, of the process. Yeah. And uh, we kind of self-moderate, you know, who's using it and that only one person is using it at a time. Thank you. And again, if anybody would like to be the guinea pig on August the 10th, whether it's on YouTube or whether it's on Zoom, if you'll just send me an email uh, to make sure that uh, we've got your name right and how to reach you and so forth, uh, then, then uh, you can be our guinea pig. And send me an email to jimkello at newtracksmodeling.com. Heath, you have a great evening and thank you so much again for being here tonight. Thank you, Jim.